Welcome. This video is introducing the concept of iterators in C++. You might be familiar with iterators already, but if not, this video should help get that idea across. So first, let's understand why these things exist and what we use them for. So a data structure user needs to be able to iterate through the elements. If I create a std array or an std pair or our dyad data structure, later on lists, vectors, so on, uh, we want to be able to loop through those elements. So write a for loop that goes through each element one at a time, visit them, do something. And uh, I expect you're familiar with how to do this in a raw array, a C array. So to do that, we would write a for loop and say, and index variable i starts at zero, i is less than n, i plus plus, and print out array subscript i, that kind of thing. So this is a pretty conventional loop. But how would we do this with an encapsulated data structure? The idea of encapsulation is an object-oriented programming discipline that the elements are stored in private data members. And that was not really the case with the std pair. Remember, std pair made the first and second elements public. But a more conventional design is to make the data elements private. And if that's happened, then you can't write a for loop like this, because the class has those data members as private members. Users of the class cannot access them. So what we need is a data type that works like i here. And that's what an iterator is, is it's a data type that you can use in this kind of for loop that visits each element one at a time. But we want to maintain this object-oriented programming practice of encapsulation, meaning that the user of the data structure and iterator cannot mess with the internal data members of the classes. And we also want abstraction so that as a programmer using iterators and data structures, I don't have to know about the implementation details of how this works. As we'll see, there's very different ways of visiting the elements of a data structure. A partially filled array works one way, a vector works a different way, a singly linked list works one way, a doubly linked list works a different way. There's all sorts of different ways of iterating through the elements, but as a user, I don't want to have to know about that. That's the idea of abstraction. I just want to be able to write a loop and not have to think about those things. So in C++, iterators are data types. An iterator type is a data type, and it represents a location within a related data structure. So for instance, there's a data structure std array, that's a array, and then std colon colon array colon colon iterator is a different data type, but a related data type that represents a location in an array. So an array iterator is a location in an array. Soon we're going to describe the vector data structure, and there's a vector iterator. A vector iterator is a location within a vector, and that pattern goes for other data structures. Forward list iterator is a location in a forward list. These are distinct data types, so just to be clear, Array iterator is a different data type from an array, because an array is a whole collection of elements. An array iterator is a location inside that collection. And all of these are different data types from each other as well. Array iterator is a class. Vector iterator is a different class. Forward list iterator is a different class. So they're not interchangeable data types. But they do have a common set of operations because they're all implementing a common abstract data type. Iterators are used as arguments to certain data structure operations. That's a big reason why we're learning about them now. It is true that they're used for loops, uh, but other high-level operations. For example, there's a erase operation that's given an iterator. It's a very convenient member function. If you know the location of an element you want to remove, you can just make this one function call and remove it. So in high-level programming, it makes our lives easier when we can call these kind of functions. In order to do that, we have to know how to create iterators and use them. For now, we're focusing on for loops just to get started with iterators. And the design of C++ iterators follows this principle of least astonishment, or P-O-L-A. This is a pretty good idea, which is that anytime you're creating things for people to use, you should try to minimize their astonishment or confusion with using it. You know, So uh, most people are used to the way that elevators work is there's a button next to the elevator, and you press that button to open the door. right? So if you're creating your own elevator, how should it work? OK, the principle of least astonishment is you should do it should work the same way. Don't make that button do something completely different. OK, so most C programmers and C++ programmers are accustomed to this kind of for loop. i equals 0, i is less than n, i plus plus, and then a body. So the design of iterators follows the same kind of pattern. The way this for loop works is first, there's a step that initializes 
loop counter i to the beginning, and the beginning is the first valid location in the array. And then the i less than n check tests if we're past the end of the array. And then we have the loop body that executes, and i plus plus increments i to the next location. Let's just study how this works in practice. So you start at a valid location, decide if we're past the end of the array, and then do something on a valid location, then we move to the next location. That pattern keeps going, which means that eventually i takes on an invalid location. The last value of i will be equal to n, and n is not a valid index. Now, it doesn't crash or anything. It works fine because of the way that the for loop works. First, we would increment i to n, then test this Boolean expression. It's false, so we skip over the body of the loop. So index starts at a valid location, gets incremented until we go past the last valid location. Iterator-based loops work the same way. So here's a preview of how they work. You have a for loop in the first statement would create an iterator i at the beginning. So this is the first valid location in the array or other data structure. As long as we're not past the end, we increment i, the iterator, and keep going. So these iterators start at a valid location. They'll end at an invalid location, this past the end concept. Here are the operations we use to manipulate iterators. So the container data type, like array, vector, forward, list, has a begin function. This is how you will typically create an iterator. And it returns an iterator at the beginning, the first valid location. The container data type has an end function. This returns an iterator that's past the end. So that's not a valid location. It's past the last valid location. And that's so that we can write a for loop that looks conventional. Then there's a different iterator data type, and it has an increment operator, plus plus. That moves to the next position. And if we're at the last valid position, plus plus moves us past the end. Iterator needs a comparison, an equal equal, typically a not equal as well, to test if two operators are at the same location, two iterators are at the same location. Uh, we need that so we can tell when the loop is over. So that's necessary so that this part right here can be written. And there's a dereference operator. That's how you get the element at this location. So if i is an iterator, then star i follows the iterator, looks at that location in the data structure, and gives you that element. Now, these are abstract operations, meaning that different container types implement them differently. Every iterator has a plus plus, equal equal, and dereference star operator, but the code for that can be substantially different, and we'll explore that later in the course. So for example, the vector implementation might store the location as an int uh, index, and plus plus increments that index. And a singly linked list iterator works on a very different principle. The location is a pointer to a node object, and plus plus follows the node's next pointer. We'll get into that pretty soon. OK, here's an example of loops using iterators. So up here, I create a standard array of seven ints called digits that holds 2782011. This is a previous example of the phone number of our school. And here's a for loop that prints out all of the elements. So uh, I, this declaration is a little unwieldy, but standard array iterator i starts at digits.begin. As long as i is not equal to digits.end, we do i++. Plus plus and print out a space and then i and then an endl at the end. So if we look over here, here's the output of that for loop. There's a space at the beginning, and then it goes space, digit, space, digit, and it works. It prints out those digits. Now, uh, I don't really like this untidiness of this extra space. So here's an alternative way that also shows a different way of manipulating iterators uh, to avoid that space. So same thing, but we're going to skip that leading space. So what I do is I create an iterator j that's at the beginning. And I print that out for sure with no space in front. And then I keep using j to loop through the remaining elements. So print out dereference j. That dereference j means follow the iterator to get that int. The first one would be 2. And then uh, now I already printed out the first element. So right here I'm doing plus plus j. That advances the iterator one step, skipping over the 2. And then the rest of the loop is pretty much the same. As long as j is not the end, We'll do a plus plus j, and the body is print out a space and then j, and then an end line at the end of that. So this is a little tidier. Uh, the first element does not have a leading space, but every subsequent element does have a space. OK, one final note on this concept of the end. It's an important concept and causes a lot of miscommunications uh, or misconceptions. So note that the, an iterator object is either at a valid location or past the end. There's two states an iterator can be in. It can be valid location. You know, two, seven, those 
actual elements of the array, or it can be in this pass the end location. The end function returns pass the end. So the rationale for this, it is a little weird, but we want to be consistent with this i less than n pattern that we see in these C-based for loops, that we're comparing a uh, an index or iterator to an invalid location. n is not a valid index, and n is not a valid iterator. So keep in mind then that if I get the beginning iterator and dereference it, that'll work because the beginning is a valid location of the first element. Dereferencing that iterator gives me the first value in the collection. That is assuming that the data structure is not empty. If it's empty, that would be a problem. Uh, but you can't dereference the end iterator because the end iterator is not a valid location. It doesn't have any element there. So if you, try, if you have an iterator pointing at the end and you dereference it, that's a logic error and it will throw an exception.